Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. In 2004, the Coens circled back around to the same well of inspiration that had given birth to O oh Brother Where Art Thou, tackling another tale set in Mississippi that used music as a narrative driving device. However, whereas that film was structured as a literal odyssey, the brothers' 11th feature film, The Lady Killers, would take the form of a screwball anti-caber that plays like a hayseed Ocean's Eleven in its efforts to remake and modernize the 1955 film of the same name. Produced in conjunction with Barry Josephson and their early cinematography partner Barry Sonnenfeld, The Lady Killers has little to add to the Coen's already formidable legacy, other than it being the first film in which both brothers received joint credit for the writing and directing. The first of their two remakes to date, 2010's True Grit being the other, The Lady Killers nevertheless brings enough of Joel and Ethan's idiosyncratic vision to the proceedings that it can stand on its own merits apart from the 1955 original. The film's cast proves more than game to match the Coen's outlandishly macabre tone. Tom Hanks clearly relishes the opportunity to ham it up in his first leading performance for the brothers. He plays the conniving Professor Dorr, a southern fried gentleman scholar with a bizarrely anxious laugh. No, 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 no. He's the ringleader of the casino heist at the center of the story, which has also contracted a motley crew of misfits from a newspaper want ad. The standouts, Marlon Wayans, J.K. Simmons, and Tai Ma provide the film with some of its best comic moments. Wayans, the newly hired janitor of the casino boat, is the rambunctious, unpredictable inside man. Simmons fills the demolitions expert role as Garth Pancake, an animal wrangler for commercials cursed with chronic IBS. And then there's Tai Ma, the mute Vietnamese shop owner known only as The General. His effortless slinking, tunneling, and cigarette swallowing abilities lead to some of the film's biggest laughs and the fact that Ma does it all while barely even speaking is a testament to his considerable physical talents. Sorry. Hank's crew might aspire to be a veritable rogues gallery, but they prove no match for Irma P. Hall's matronly widow and boarding house owner, Marva Munson. Hall's stubborn indignation and outsized sense of evangelical virtue makes for an endearingly sweet and poignant character that can hold her own against the basement full of criminals underfoot. Roger Deakins returns as director of photography, crafting a gorgeous-looking 35mm film image, framed in the Coen's preferred 185 to 1 aspect ratio. The film draws from a murky palette of earth tones and bright primaries, taking on a warm tobacco tint. The camera work is appropriately elaborate in proportion to the film's comfortable budget, consisting of artful dolly and crane movements that add scale to the story. The Coen's also utilize an inspired POV shot from within a football player's helmet during a chaotic game. The visual presentation, rich with dynamic canted angles and kinetic energy, shows the Coens and Deacons working off a much more inspired vision than the comparatively straightforward intolerable cruelty. Dennis Gazner reprises his production design duties as well, bringing a timeless old world charm to the Deep South. The languid pacing, courtesy of the Coens editing alter ego Roderick Janes, echoes the leisurely southern mentality while incorporating the dynamic intrigue necessary for an effective caper. Yeah. Carter Burwell is again credited as crafting the score, but the Coens prioritize returning music supervisor T-Bone Burnett's suite of source tracks to infuse the Lady Killers with a distinct gospel, blues, hip-hop, and folk patina. Like Intolerable Cruelty before it, the Lady Killers doesn't boldly proclaim itself to be a quote-unquote Coen Brothers film, but it nevertheless builds on many of the familiar images and ideas that constitute their unique aesthetic. The aforementioned soundtrack speaks to the brothers' thematic fascination with the traditions of American music, as does music's use as a narrative device, whereby Professor Dorr and his crew plan and execute their heist under Munson's nose using their cover as a classical ensemble practicing in the basement. The Coen's fondness for exaggerated minor characters and slapstick humor is present throughout, as is their decidedly pro-working-class worldview. As embodied in Munson's stubborn church lady, the heroes of the Lady Killers are noble members of the blue-collar community, suspicious of sleazy conmen disguising themselves as high-society intellectuals. As they did in Fargo, the Coens use junk food as a subtle way to convey their character's lack of pretension, primarily via the casino's overweight security guard. Over God damn! The Lady Killers premiered at the 2004 Cannes Film Festival, where it won the Jury Prize Award. However, this warm reception abroad didn't necessarily translate to success at home. 
The decidedly mixed reviews and lukewarm box office sealed the film's fate as a minor work in the Coen's canon. While it hasn't gone on to spawn a cold following to the likes of The Big Lebowski, The Lady Killers nevertheless possesses a distinct charm and easy appeal, the cinematic equivalent of comfort food. In 2006, a film called Paris Je T'aime premiered with a unique concept. It was an omnibus film, consisting of 20 separate shorts directed by 20 different directors. The common thread uniting them was that timeless city of light, Paris. Joel and Ethan were among this eclectic group, arguably contributing one of the best shorts of the entire project. Titled Tuileries, the short features Cohen regular Steve Buscemi's bizarre run-in with a pair of Parisian lovers in the eponymous underground subway station. The short is no more than five minutes long, but the Coens are able to pack a great deal of their specific brand of comedy and quirk into the piece. They effortlessly convey a complicated comic scenario using only French dialogue and Buscemi's increasingly confused facial expressions. The film is shot by Bruno Del Benel in a departure from the Coens' usual cinematographer Roger Deakins. However, Del Benel faithfully replicates the Coens' established look earning himself some creative goodwill that would lead to him also standing in for Deakins as the cinematographer for 2013's Inside Lewin Davis. Tuileries' subterranean location is rendered in a saturated amber hue that's romantic and wistful, a device that lulls Bashimi's American tourist into a complacent state. The short-form medium limitations and self-imposed dialogue restrictions on Bashimi's part allows the Coens to really dig into what they do best, outlandish characters getting into absurd scenarios with unexpected results. Like Raising Arizona or Intolerable Cruelty, there's a distinct Buster Keaton-style physicality to the humor, which, in the context of Tuileries' nearly dialogue-free story, takes on the feel of a silent film. For the sake of the story, supporting characters like the jealous boyfriend, the seductive woman, and the pellet-shooting brat resemble archetypes rather than nuanced characters, recalling the exaggerated minor characters in the Coen's feature work. Other thematic signatures include the alienated outsider perspective, embodied in Buscemi's average Joe American tourist who can't speak the language and doesn't understand the intricate social customs, as well as the use of music to convey the local flavor of their setting via the Parisian street performer. Tuileries is only the second short film the Coens have made to date, if you're counting Joel's student film soundings, but it's just as entertaining and biting as their feature work. Paris Je T'aime went on to premiere at Cannes, becoming a sleeper hit that would span a whole series of omnibus films about major cities like New York, Rio de Janeiro, and Jerusalem. For the Coens themselves, their participation with the film concludes a brief era of exaggerated, yet admittedly generic, screwball comedies. If anything, these films serve as the proverbial calm before the storm, lulling viewers into a pleasant complacency that would soon be shattered by an onslaught of challenging and career-best work. What if there was a platform that you could access everything? Hundreds of hours of content accessed globally. Interviews with legends. Online courses and tutorials. Feature films and documentaries. All in one place. What does it cost? Next to nothing.